the story of the Lancaster Bomber in World War II has fallen into legend. Even excluding the 156,000 sorties the aircraft flew in its bread and butter role as a heavy bomber, the aircraft made a dramatic impact on the war thanks to its adaptability for special missions, such as sinking the Tirpitz battleship, dropping the largest conventional bomb of the war, and of course, the immortalized Dam Buster raids. All of these feats were thanks to the greatness of this weapon. But, as is often the case with greatness, it so very nearly wasn't to be. For the story of the Lancaster actually begins with the downfall of an earlier Avro aircraft that failed to live up to the high expectations that birthed it. In today's episode, we're going to look at one of those truly great forgotten aircraft whose real contribution to history was to provide a step up for the legend that was to come. This is the story of the Avro Manchester. Welcome to Wars of the World. The Royal Air Force was founded on April 1st, 1918. Expecting the war to go on to 1919, the RAF had issued a number of advanced specifications for aircraft that would enter into service that year, but the war ending on November 11th, 1918 saw nearly all of these promising aircraft designs left at the drawing board. The 1920s was a difficult time for the infant service, as it struggled to find not only its own identity, but funding for newer designs of aircraft. The new types entering service in the 1930s were still biplanes, and only marginal improvements over those at the end of World War I. With few government sponsorships for research and development, it was left to competitions such as the Schneider Trophy for aviation companies to demonstrate their prowess and skill in the hope of an order. One of the major British firms involved in development and manufacturing of aero engines was Rolls-Royce, who produced a number of winning engines in the early 1930s, and then applied this experience in the development of engines for commercial and military applications, when the time for them to be needed came later. That time began to appear in the mid-1930s, as Europe appeared to be stumbling from one crisis to another, first with the Italian dictator Mussolini, who was bent on building a new Italian empire in Africa, and then with Hitler's Germany, which was rearming and expected to reclaim territory lost after the war. There were also serious concerns about Japan's actions in the Far East, and how these might impact British possessions there. Anticipating a major British rearmament program on the horizon, which would no doubt include faster and heavier aircraft, in 1935, Rolls-Royce began development of a new and more powerful engine that they could submit for RAF requirements. At the time, the company was enjoying great success with its Kestrel engine, which was powering a wide array of British, Dutch, and even a few German aircraft, including the prototypes for the later Stuka dive bomber and the Messerschmitt Bf 109 fighter. The Kestrel 5, an improved variant, was a 21-litre V12 engine, capable of 685 horsepower at takeoff. But while this was good for the older biplanes, the future monoplanes would need twice that power. It wasn't simply a case of building a bigger engine. The Rolls-Royce team knew that the RAF would impose size restrictions on the new aircraft, so they could operate from RAF bases that would need the minimum alterations to hangars and runways. This meant keeping the size of the engines to a minimum to fit on these aircraft. The teams at Rolls-Royce examined a number of design possibilities, such as more advanced superchargers and a whole host of other technical innovations. But one proposal seemed to offer a tantalizing solution that, if it worked, could potentially give the power of two engines in just one. Instead of the more traditional V12 arrangement of cylinders in the Kestrel, the new engine would have a second bank of cylinders, bringing the total to 24, all arranged in an X shape around a single crankshaft. This had the advantage of keeping the engine's dimensions relatively low, but at the same time, theoretically offering twice the power. 
Despite this unorthodox design, Rolls-Royce reused as much of the technology from the proven Kestrel as they could, allowing them to keep the changes to their manufacturing process to a minimum, and it was expected this would also improve reliability. On September 1st, 1937, precisely two years before Hitler invaded Poland, the engine, now dubbed Vulture, was run for the first time. In the subsequent months of testing that followed, the engine was recorded producing the jaw-dropping figure at the time of 1,750 horsepower. However, the design was still an immature one, and development was hampered by reliability issues. But nevertheless, the Air Ministry was already sufficiently interested to issue a specification for a new bomber powered by the X-24 Vulture engine. On July 14th, 1936, the Royal Air Force formed Bomber Command, whose envisioned role would be to use a fleet of long-range bombers to devastate an enemy's ability to wage war by destroying his weapons manufacturing and transport base, as well as disrupt communication and transport links. No longer were bombing aircraft a mere extension of artillery, they were now potentially war-winning weapons, and to capitalize on the new force's mission, it needed to replace the lumbering biplanes with newer, faster, longer-ranged monoplanes, capable of carrying very heavy bomb loads. There were already a number of new promising designs appearing when Bomber Command became operational, such as the Handley Page Hamden, which first flew a month prior, but the Air Ministry was already looking ahead to even more advanced designs. Thus, in August of that year, they issued Specification P-1336, which outlined some rather exacting requirements for the new bomber. It was to be able to carry an 8,000-pound bomb load out to a range of some 2,000 miles and at a cruise speed of 275 miles per hour. With the UK, like much of the rest of the world, still reeling from the Great Depression, every effort had to be made to manufacture and operate the aircraft as cheaply as possible. This meant that it had to be able to use the existing infrastructure that was in place, which placed restrictions on dimensions and weight. Realizing that building the bomber they wanted, but with such restrictions imposed on them on the ground, might not be feasible, the Air Ministry included the capacity for the aircraft to be assisted in takeoff by a catapult. Another requirement was that the new aircraft was not a one-trick pony, and was expected to carry out multiple missions, including attacking enemy troops at the front lines, where range would be sacrificed for a heavier bomb load. In order to improve accuracy, the aircraft was expected to be able to conduct a 60-degree dive. Additional roles envisioned included reconnaissance, the launching of torpedoes in the anti-shipping role, and even carrying 16 fully armed paratroopers. The specifications were sent to all the main British manufacturers, but in the end it would fall to proposals from two of them to compete for the order, Handley Page and Avro. Building such a demanding aircraft would have been a tall order for any company, but Avro was certainly seen as the wildcard, having produced a string of bomber designs during and after the First World War that failed to attract an order. One such failed design was the Avro 533, which was adorned the name Manchester, and was part of the RAF's plan for 1919, but delayed and then cancelled after the engines it was expected to use were delayed. Handley Page, on the other hand, was known as THE British Bomber Manufacturer, and was now expected to take the contract, but that didn't stop Avro from pouring everything they had into their proposal. Avro's proposal, dubbed the Avro Type 679, went head-to-head -head with Handley Page's HB56. The Avro design would make extensive use of the latest metal manufacturing process, and the design was significantly cleaner than previous bombers, producing an aerodynamically efficient aircraft. Using their calculations on the aircraft's projected size and weight, and the data coming in from Rolls-Royce on their new engine, the Avro team, led by famed engineer Roy Chadwick, reason that the 679 had the promise to not only meet the performance requirements, but absolutely shatter them. Top speed, for example, was expected to match that of a Hawker Hurricane fighter, being in the region of 350 miles per hour, which would make intercepting the bomber extremely difficult, since intercepting fighters need a significantly higher top speed to catch up with their targets. The answer was obvious to the Air Ministry. 
the Avro Type 679, upon its entry into service, would likely become a super weapon. And with that, Avro had defeated Handley Page and the other contenders to the grand prize, and over 200 were ordered straight off the drawing board. However, Handley Page was far from out of the fight entirely. Like the 679, the HP-56 was expected to be powered by the Rolls-Royce Vulture, but concerns over the availability of the engine, given the delays in its development, was giving the Air Ministry cause for concern. They therefore approached Handley Page and asked them to alter their HP-56 to instead make use of the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, which was being used to power the Hurricane and Supermarine Spitfire fighters. The Merlin-powered HP-56 was seen as a safer fallback should the Vulture-powered Avro Type 679 fail to live up to expectations. There was little time for Avro to celebrate. The Air Ministry had given them just 12 months from the go-ahead order to produce a working prototype, and it was not long before the timetable began to slip. Instead, it would not be until June 25th, 1939, some 21 months later, that the new aircraft, the second Avro bomber designed to be named Manchester, took to the air. The Avro aircraft had a wingspan of 90 feet and 1 inch, and a length of 70 feet. More than previous aircraft, the Manchester took great consideration to crew comfort and ergonomics in an effort to ease the burden of the long-range bombing operations the type was unexpected to undertake. One of the more distinctive features of the design was the large greenhouse-style cockpit, which offered excellent all-round view for the pilots, while beneath the aircraft was a long, unobstructed bomb bay that allowed the aircraft to be configured for a wide variety of ordnance types. Both the dive bombing and catapult requirements were subsequently dropped, although the prototype retained the capacity for the latter. Originally, the aircraft featured a twin tail arrangement, but a third fin was added on the fuselage to aid stability. The Manchester was defended by gun turrets in the nose, tail, and dorsal positions, while a ventral gun turret was trialed, aiming to protect the aircraft from attacks directly below. But its value was seen as limited, and after problems with its installation arose, it was dropped. But of course, a bomber is only an armed glider if it doesn't have any engines, and the problems for Rolls-Royce and their Vulture engine were far from over. There were a number of problems with the overly complex engine, but the biggest one lay in frequent failures of the bearings on the end of the connecting rod as a result of insufficient lubrication and excessive wear. Nevertheless, Rolls-Royce tried to reassure Avro, the RAF, and the Air Ministry that they could iron out these problems, but following the outbreak of war with Germany on September 3, 1939, priority was given to the development and manufacturing of the Rolls-Royce Merlin, particularly in the summer of 1940, during the Battle of Britain, when the engines were needed the most for the fighters. With development stalling, the decision was taken to derate the power of the Vulture, reducing the strain on the engine and increasing reliability, in order to provide workable engines to get the Manchester airframes into service against the Nazis. However, this was not what Avro wanted to hear. Since they had made their initial calculations, the aircraft's weight had dramatically increased, and with a heavier aircraft powered by derated engines, any notion of being as fast as a hurricane were gone. In the end, the Manchester's top speed proved a woefully disappointing 265 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour less than the P-13-36 cruising speed requirement. Nevertheless, the need for bombers and the fact that the first batch of aircraft had already been ordered meant that soon the Manchester would be reaching operational squadrons and joining the war in the air against Nazi Germany. On August 5th, 1940, the first production model Manchester was delivered to the RAF to undertake service acceptance tests. The RAF initially decided on a crew complement of six, comprising a pilot, a second pilot who was there to not only support the pilot, but gain experience, an observer who was responsible for navigation, bomb aiming, and manning the front turret, two wireless operators who could also man one of the gun positions, and a dedicated rear gunner. This arrangement would prove inefficient, and as experience grew, the crew configuration would change drastically over time. Meanwhile, a new squadron was formed for the bomber, number 207, based at RAF Waddington, which began training on the type in November, but it would not be until February the following year that the squadron would take their new mounts into action. The German-occupied French harbour at Brest had become a major hub for German naval operations against the vital convoys crossing the North Atlantic, 
and on January 4, 1941, RAF photographic reconnaissance revealed the German cruiser Admiral Hipper had put in for repairs there, and a series of air raids were ordered in an effort to sink it and destroy the docks. These failed to achieve their goal, and the Hipper conducted a brief foray into the North Atlantic in the beginning of February, where its guns sent seven merchant ships to the bottom of the ocean before returning to port. The RAF were now determined to destroy the vessel and the harbour, and thus organised a major raid for February 24th, 1941. The raid would provide the Manchester with its baptism of fire, as six aircraft from number 207 squadron began taking off at 1835 hours into the darkened winter skies and heading for France. Five of the aircraft were armed with 12 500-pound bombs, while the sixth, for reasons still unknown, was armed with just 11. Compared to missions over Germany, the flight to Brest was a relatively short one, but by no means any less dangerous. Given the raids earlier in the year, the Germans had heavily reinforced the air defences around Brest, and as each bomber approached the target area, the sky was illuminated with the ominous beams from German searchlights towering into the sky, followed by hundreds of flashes from exploding anti-aircraft shells, flak so thick you could walk on it. Unlike the tight formation flying in daylight, the Manchesters operated almost totally independently during the hours of darkness, with altitudes varying from 15,000 feet down to just 8,000, where the flak was heaviest but accuracy was improved. The Manchesters opted to make two runs over the target area, each time dropping half their loads, their reason being that this would throw off German intelligence trying to assess the maximum bomb load of the new RAF bomber. All six Manchesters dropped off their weapons and then returned home, but they had not come off unscathed. One Manchester suffered damage to its hydraulics and was unable to close its bomb bay doors, which imposed heavy drag on the aircraft, slowing it down and leaving it the last to return home. Another Manchester suffered a hydraulic leak that sprayed the pilot's windscreen, leaving him flying home blind for much of the return to Britain and forcing him to divert, while another Manchester suffered mechanical problems and also had to divert. Despite this, the Manchester had proven it could conduct bombing operations and was quickly becoming a regular player in the RAF's plans, and Manchesters would eventually equip eight Bomber Command squadrons. At the same time, Avro were incorporating improvements to the aircraft on the construction line, such as deleting the central fin on the fuselage after incorporating larger twin tail fins and rudders, giving the dorsal gunner a clearer view of the upper rear hemisphere. However, the immaturity of the Vulture engine design was about to truly manifest. They were extraordinarily work intensive for the ground crews to keep running, but even the best maintained examples were prone to some truly catastrophic bearing failures as they were pushed during the demanding tempo of combat operations. More than one flight would end in disaster, as the engine disintegrated in its housing, sending pistons and rods flying out of the block like missiles. As a result, serviceability rates for the Manchesters were shockingly low compared to other aircraft. Bomber Command was growing increasingly frustrated with the Manchesters, whose crews, many of whom had vital combat experience in other types, were left sitting around the crew room waiting for engines to be repaired or replaced, while their comrades were being thrown against the Nazi war machine. On April 13th, 1941, they had had enough and grounded the Manchester fleet less than two months after the raid on Brest. However, the problems were not limited to Rolls-Royce's engines. Avro's design also had a number of defects that manifested themselves during operations, such as the problem with hydraulic fluid links that had been encountered on the first operation. The crews reverted to older types, such as the Hampton, while every effort was made to improve the reliability of the Manchester. It would not be until four months later that the Manchester would return to combat flying, but even then, reliability was a constant headache for all concerned, and with news that after manufacturing 538 engines, Rolls-Royce was stopping production of the Vulture altogether, the writing was on the wall for the Manchester. In November of 1941, all production orders for the aircraft were dropped. In total, including prototypes, just 202 Manchesters were built, and of these, around 15% were written off due to engine-related mishaps. Excluding those lost in combat, the Manchesters remaining in service were now being flown until they simply couldn't anymore for lack of spare parts. While most continued on as bombers into 1942, 
they were increasingly being used in the test role, including the testing of air-launched torpedoes for RAF Coastal Command, one of the original requirements for the aircraft. But while the Manchester would slowly fly on towards oblivion, it would have a minor but by no means less noteworthy role in a key RAF operation. In February 1942, Bomber Command got a new commander whose bullish presence was immediately felt everywhere. Air Marshal Sir Arthur Harris was one of those great but controversial leaders of the Second World War, and when faced by the previous poor results of Bomber Command, he adopted the policy that in order to really give Hitler a bloody nose, you needed to give him a bigger punch. Thus, on May 30th, 1942, he enacted Operation Millennium, the first thousand bomber raid in history. Nearly every available aircraft in Bomber Command that could carry a weapon was put to the air creating an immense aerial armada, the likes of which the world had never seen, and sent it out to destroy the German city of Cologne. Among this force of bombers were 35 Manchesters, and it would be on this historic raid that the Manchester force would earn its one and only Victoria Cross, the highest award for bravery in the British armed forces. Flying officer Leslie Manser was piloting a Manchester when he and his crew became caught in searchlights over the city. Having dropped their bombs, they began taking heavy anti-aircraft fire, forcing him to take evasive action in order to escape the city's defenses, but not before his rear gunner was wounded and one of his vultures being damaged and filling the aircraft with smoke. Mansur attempted to nurse the Manchester back to base, but before long, the damaged engine burst into flames and his airspeed began to fall dangerously low. By now, they were over Belgium and Mansa ordered the crew to begin bailing out as the aircraft was quickly becoming unstable, but he refused to leave the controls of the Manchester, instead wrestling with them long enough for his men to safely abandon the aircraft. As his crew gently floated down to earth, they saw the bomber crash in flames into a dike at Brie in Belgium, killing the pilot who had saved their lives. One of the surviving airmen from Mansa's aircraft would later be captured by the Germans, but incredibly, the five remaining airmen all managed to escape back to the UK, where they told their stories, after which Flying Officer Mansa was awarded the VC. Less than one month later, the Manchester dropped its last bomb in anger in a raid on the German city of Bremen. During their career, the Manchesters flew 1,269 sorties with Bomber Command, dropping 1,826 tons of bombs. Of the 193 aircraft that served in frontline squadrons, 78 would be lost in action. Barely three months after the long overdue first flight of the Manchester, Handley Page took their new bomber developed from the HP-56 aloft for the first time. The new bomber, which had dispensed with the two Vulture engines, as had been originally planned, was now powered by four of the ubiquitous Merlins. This produced the Handley Page Halifax, and this aircraft would go on to enjoy enormous success, but it would also demonstrate how far behind the times the Manchester was beginning to look. Knowing he had a winning design for a bomber, but growing increasingly impatient with Rolls-Royce over the Vulture, in early 1940, Roy Chadwick began looking at alternative options to power the Manchester. The problem was that the type of engines that could seriously be considered for powering the Manchester were few and far between, as the aircraft was designed around two engines rated at over 2,000 horsepower, a massive figure for the time. Two engines received serious consideration by the Avro team, namely the Napier Sabre and the Bristol Centaurus. The Sabre, like the Vulture, was a 24-cylinder engine, but differed in that the cylinders were arranged in an even more radical H configuration. The Sabre proved exceptionally powerful, being capable of producing between 2200 and 2400 horsepower in tests, but getting the engine into production was proving extremely troublesome. The Bristol Engine Company's Centaurus, on the other hand, was an 18-cylinder sleeve valve radial engine. In a radial engine, the cylinders radiate outward from a central crankcase, giving them their distinctive rounded shape. The Centaurus was a remarkably advanced engine and was producing figures in excess of 2,000 horsepower. But while the installation of two pre-production examples were reportedly trialed in a Manchester airframe by Avro, the engine was just as, if not more, delayed than the Vulture, owing to Bristol becoming committed to producing their older Hercules engines, for a string of aircraft already in service. While these proposals came to nothing, 
a new option was beginning to appear on the horizon. The Rolls-Royce Merlin had been such a success in fighters and some early bombers that the Air Ministry had ordered research into improving it. As a result, the more traditional and reliable Merlin was starting to catch up to the Vulture, but while fitting this engine would go a long way to improving reliability, it would still leave the Manchester an underperformer. Chadwick knew there was only one option if he was to utilize the Merlin. He was going to need more of them. Working on a production Manchester airframe, which still had its central fin, the wings were extended by almost 10 feet to accommodate an extra pair of engines in the form of Merlin 20s, rated at 1,240 horsepower, which gave a combined power output of just under 5,000 HP. Initially dubbed the Manchester 3, the team at Avro soon bestowed another name on this aircraft. That new name was Lancaster. On January 9th, 1941, as the Manchester crews were preparing to begin their first flight against the enemy, the Lancaster prototype BT-308 took to the air. The difference in performance over the Manchester was staggering, and all involved knew they now had the war-winning aircraft they had desired since 1936. Development of a production Lancaster was remarkably swift, and production in Britain and Canada would total 7,377 aircraft, all of which were powered by Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, save for 300 Lancaster IIs, which were fitted with the Bristol Hercules VI. Thus, from the ashes of the Manchester, the Lancaster emerged as a beautiful phoenix. Quickly withdrawn from frontline service, the older aircraft would spend its final days acting as a crew trainer for prospective Lancaster crews until 1943, when they were finally grounded, with few showing any regrets about it. In the face of such a legendary aircraft as the Lancaster, it seemed there was a collective effort to forget the troublesome Manchester. Typifying this is the statement that often surrounds the Lancaster's development, with it said that it was one of the few warplanes in history that was, quote, right from the start, completely ignoring the history of the Lancaster's unlucky older brother, which had many a hard lesson to learn and then bestow on its younger stablemate. And there you have the tale of the Avro Manchester. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.